Welcome again to Osher Online, and we're going to continue our discussion about the megalith by looking at who built these incredible structures. I'm going to be focusing on England, but it applies probably to most of Europe. Now, of course, when we see these big stones, we often like to uh, invoke ancient giants of race that undoubtedly lived in the past because who else could lift these giant stones? And once they were built, of course, fairies lived in them. They may have helped build them, but they are often called fairy houses. But there's also these folkloric admonitions that if you dance on Sunday, like the, the maidens of Cornwall, you might be turned to stone or the roll right rocks which were kings who uh, irritated somebody and got turned to stone, or soldiers. And then the fallback. Who else could build the pyramids or the megaliths but aliens? Recently, an alien uh, UFO group noticed a photo from Mars and said, look, we have found another Stonehenge there on Mars built by the same aliens who built Stonehenge. But it was people, not the Neanderthals, not the early Ice Age modern humans. Although they left their residual DNA, Neanderthal DNA is still with us, less than 2% in modern humans. No, we're going to be talking about the early modern, anatomically, culturally modern humans in the sense that made it into Europe out of Africa around 36,000 years ago. They just had very primitive stone tools uh, and not even arrows in many cases. We know about them from looking at their DNA extracted from bones and we can classify them into what are called haplogroups. And some of the earliest groups to come into uh, at least Northern Europe with the K and the U and the M, uh, don't worry about these, but if you, uh, know a little bit about ancestry research, you will encounter these haplogroups. You notice just the straggling R, this will become very important as we talk about this. We can in fact, all the way back from our chromosomal atom, follow the early Paleolithic people into Europe, but also the more modern, uh, and that's the red line there, leading to the R groups and that we'll come back to. It's very complicated, but very well worked out. I'm not gonna talk much about this, but some of you may wanna do some deeper research. The Paleolithic cultures were all hunter-gatherers, but they were very good artists, and it's around 30,000 to 25,000 years ago that we see these incredible Venus figures. These people lived through another ice age, uh, and the Ice Ages ended about 12,000 years ago. Three quarters of England was covered by ice. And the first modern, uh, what we would consider modern humans, made it into England around eight, 9,000 years ago. And this is a re facial reconstruction of Cheddar Man, found in Somerset, uh, died a violent death. And we can put him in a particular haplo, haplo group uh, and interesting, he could not digest milk. Dairy cattle hadn't made it here yet. He was dark skinned, dark haired, and hazel eyed. And when they did a search in the Somerset area, they found he still has descendants living in the same region. Most of Western Europe was hunter gatherers. They're broken into two cultural groups, a Western form and an Eastern form. Uh, there is some agriculture and domestication of animals in the Fertile Crescent and in the Balkan area. But the megalithic Stone Age, when these big structures were built, really occurs only from 4,000 to 2,000 years ago. So who were these builders? And when we talk about the megalithic advancement with agriculture and modern types of stone and pottery and so on. This happened in different times and different places. Uh, 
So when we talk about Neolithic, realize, talk about a particular area, things happen at different times because of migrations and so on. Hunter-gatherers slowly, around 8,000 years ago in Southern Europe, get replaced by farmers, and then by 4,000 years ago or so, the farming actually makes it up into England. So this is called the Neolithization, <laughs> coming out of the Fertile Crescent and the Levant, spreading along the coast and traveling by boat, and then eventually around 4,000 years ago into England. And we can still see remnants of this spread uh, in the haplogroup G. And they did cross by boat probably uh, into England around 4,000 years ago. These are sometimes called the Anatolian Neolithic groups because they rose mostly uh, in the Turkish area. And a couple of things, this has to do with uh, genes, specific genes, and of interest are the two arrows are pointing where blue eyes come in and drop out and where light skin comes in. So these first Anatolian farmers brought light skin into the Neolithic Bronze Age in, in most of Europe. But there was still this dark hair dark eyes. This is from a woman in Gibraltar. This is a facial reconstruction. Uh, and oddly, there's evidence of when these farmers came with uh, domestic animals, they also brought bubonic plague or they encountered bubonic plague and then took it back. It's not sure, but bubonic plague probably wiped out people when these Anatolian farmers were spreading and that may have allowed them to take over the landscape because the earlier people were basically decimated by plague. And we can see this very well. The red are the farmers, or excuse me, the red are the hunter-gatherers in these different regions. And starting around 4,000 years ago, the Anatolian farmers completely replaced them, swamped them, if you will, both genetically and culturally. This was probably not a violent takeover, but uh, sort of over 2,000 years or so interbreeding. So here's the general picture, a lot of uh, travel by maritime into Spain, and then from Spain and France into uh, west coast of Europe or e England, but also it moved to the east. And one of the features of this Neolithic were these beautifully polished axes. And many of these are found inside passage tombs and they probably represent status symbols or a form of wealth because these were not tools used for working. These were, uh, these indicated wealth and rank. And how did they polish these stones, which, <laughs> uh, were called dragon claws, dragon marks in the past, were, were these uh, chert and uh, jasper axes would be ground down and smooth. And a little island cluster uh, off of Sweden has dozens and dozens of these, very interesting. And they were probably traded over great distances. Also, flint was mined, and this is Grimes graves and each one of these depressions was a deep pit hard uh, hard rock mine and they mined mostly with deer antlers and then they would uh, hoist them up with hoists or climb up with ladders so this is a remnant of the Neolithic even though it's pockmarked mines and other features these show up all over England but they're especially prevalent in Scotland and again quite often in passage tombs as status symbols. They're called toey balls, and they are about golf ball size, but intricately shaped only by using other stone tools. These are solid basalts and sandstones and quartzites, but carved somehow just using other stones. 
Now, remember the Neolithic Revolution. I don't want to talk too much about that, but suffice it to say, new things came in. Potting, although potting is extremely old, probably going back 15,000 years or more in China and Japan. And there are two main strategies, coiling and then later, much later, uh, around 3,000 years ago in Samaria, the potter's wheel. And it's interesting, both of these techniques are still used. And pottery could be used to make figures like this great Venus uh, or this pot from Japan, about 8,000 years old. And then they could be used to make stamps and later tablets. And we think that Sumerian clay work initially started having counting tokens as ways of keeping track of sales, and then later trading tokens, which could have been money, and then picture seals, which probably were receipts, and then eventually around 3,000 in the Sumerian area, actual cuneiforms, which are the first form of written language. So these uh, overlap in their technology. So potter's wheels and working with clay gave rise eventually to all sorts of things like uh, money. It also, uh, and writing, but this I think is really interesting because it's a Turkish uh, city, 5,000 years old, but this probably is a game as best we can figure out. And it, <laughs> what did these people do during their sheltering in place? They played games. How about this one? This is a board game, which is still played. It's called 20 squares. And this is uh, 6 or 4,000 years old. And it is almost identical to the modern version of 20 squares. Weaving, uh, which initially came from twisting and tying into string and then later spinning, but weaving into cloth, very, very important. Boat building, we don't know much about it, especially in Europe because, or in England because there's so little evidence and the sea level has buried everything underwater. But they did have sewn plank boats, which may have made the crossing. There were some sailboats, uh, but it's, I always wonder how the heck and who brought the pigs and the cattle and the sheep to England and how did they get around the Mediterranean? They did have boats, but we have almost no evidence of them. Paleolithic people just in temporary shelters, but Neolithic became settled. And this is a big advantage with agriculture. You could have wattle and daub, that is mud, uh, uh, thatch on the roof or even turf on the roof. Very warm, very cozy. And these then were put into little village settlements extended families, friends, and so on, sometimes guarded, as you see. This is a henge that uh, is built the way most people would expect the henge, that is, as kind of a moat. Some of these on the Isle of Orkney were stony, stone walls, stone uh, foundations. This is a place that's being excavated right now. Uh, also in Orkney, just a few miles from there, is a coastal, uh, beautiful place because it's right on the beach. Uh, a stone foundation, probably roofed over uh, an extended family. And this is called Scarabray. A lot of those toey balls were found there, but also other things like this beautiful uh, figurine, which is pretty rare in England, uh, sometimes called an Orkney uh, Venus. Who were these people? This is a, a reconstruction of a, woman, a young girl found in Denmark, uh, about 4000 BC. Uh, we know everything about her because a piece of birch gum, the original <laughs> uh, birch flavored chewing, chewing gum was from birch sap and her DNA was all mixed up with it. And not only could we figure out her look and her hair and her skin, but we also know that she ate her last meal was duck and also hazelnuts. Well, the spread of ag agriculture coming out of the Fertile Crescent and the Anatolian area took a while to get across Europe. It did make it into the British Isles around 4,000 years. And 
these were people moving with their culture and their genes. So this is just the uh, delineation of the spread of agriculture. And it was pretty widespread. There was also agricultural that spread into North, into Central Africa, as well as in uh, East into uh, down the Tigris Euphrates. Population probably took off a little bit because suddenly there was an abundance of food that could be stored. You could get through lean times. Uh, but population really didn't take off until quite recently. So even with this modern advantage of extra food, Neolithic populations were probably pretty scarce. And here's one of the first groups that came with the Anatolian farmers, the G haplotype group. And you can still see where they're the strongest in the uh, uh, Fertile Crescent area, and they match the spread of uh, agriculture. This is another group that came, but they mostly ended up in uh, Germany and also in Scandinavia. Animals were domesticated at different times in different places. We tend to think of uh, the main agricultural uh, animals as sheep and goats and uh, cattle, which came out of Europe, and the pigs. Dogs probably 30,000 years ago in multiple places, uh, and also horses in multiple places. So they really didn't get spread until around 3,000 BC. Again, the center for most of these animals was in the Anatolian Upper Fertile Crescent area. It took a long time to get across Europe. As I mentioned, the horse probably didn't make it into England until about 2,000 years ago. Pigs were domesticated in multiple areas and they traveled very well. And one interesting thing, uh, we can see that initially the pig was domesticated to a much smaller version and today we domesticated them back to a big version but they made it into England at least 5,000 years ago and uh, or 5,000 BC and they were a predominant food item especially for celebrations and often people would be buried with pig bones as well as deer bones. The cattle uh, during the Pleistocene and the Paleolithic, the giant auroch was widespread, but it quickly went extinct around 8,000 years ago. Uh, it did become domesticated in Eurasia. We don't know if it lasted in England, and people have been trying to back cross it so you could get this big one. Modern cattle are much, much smaller. The spread of these uh, went east and south and west. So there are different breeds and different centers for domestication. And with them, uh, especially the uh, western cow, which was milked, there was a dairy revolution that came with the cattle, including cheese and yogurt and kefir and so on. And that necessitated an, an, a, a genetic change in people if they were going to tolerate this, because as you know, um, babies can digest the milk sugar, but eventually they lose it. But under the pressure of continual dairy-based foods, a mutation occurred in the lactase enzyme, which breaks down the milk sugar. And so we see the spread of lactase persistence if you remember the Iceman, who was a very interesting Otzi, who was found in the Italian Alps, he was lactose intolerant, but he was also a very older uh, haplotype. He was actually, his closest relatives were from Sardinia. So the modern Neolithic English people lived in villages. They did have cattle, sheep. Um, they had good housing and cooperation and probably chieftains of some sort. With the spread of the Anatolian farmers came an, an assortment of bling. Uh, a little too early for gold, but lots of shells, exotic shells and uh, rings and teeth, especially teeth were very popular to drill. And then with the Anatolian farmers, uh, there probably came a patrilineal 
uh, chieftain uh, kind of inheritance and leadership. And the megalithic culture, which spread across Europe, but also through the Mediterranean, and explains why there is a tradition in Sardinia and Malta and in Siberian or Iberian Peninsula. This also matches quite a bit of the Celtic language and culture movement. These uh, indicate, the red dots indicate where the megalithic cultures in Europe are the oldest. So they probably spread from about 4000 BC from Brittany and uh, Iberia into England. And so the earliest we see in England really are around 3000, uh, late 3000 BC or 4000. So it was a very short lived phenomenon. And one of the initial structures that were built on the hilltops, uh, terrace structures that had a uh, henge after henge after henge, which could be defensive, but then on the very top, it was leveled out. And these were probably communal uh, organization, uh, governmental centers that left the flat farmland for individual ownership, which is interesting because now is when private ownership, not only of uh, personal property, but also of land came in. These hilltop areas probably were celebration centers as much as uh, governmental centers, and people may have had to come in and do their kind of communal labor there or down in the fields. Many of these later became medieval hilltop forts, uh, and you can still see some of these. There's a very big one actually near the Stonehenge Salisbury Plain. So some were uh, villages unto themselves, but most of Neolithic had surrounding farm land with small villages and settlements unto themselves. Love this picture. This is what is called a causewayed fort, terraced uh, with a little village on top. And this was a woman who was uh, recovered a full skeleton. She was only about 20 years old, well nourished. Uh, and about 4000 BC and interesting from the end and ancient DNA, she was dark eyed, dark skinned and dark haired, not what we tend to think of as ancient Britons. Megalithic culture in Britain really runs from the late 3000 BC to about 2000 with a host of different areas and a host of different kinds of structures. Uh, Many of these things may have taken a thousand or two thousand years to reach final form. Uh, they would start maybe with a ring of, uh, with a henge, which is the, the ditch, then with timber, and then with stone, and then maybe the stone would be closed over into a passage, uh, a burial of some chieftain or such, and then all of this buried under a tumulus of rubble and then turf to make a passage tomb. And many of these passage tombs uh, would be shut down. So by the year 2000 BC, the megalithic culture in England is pretty much over. It gets more ornate. This is uh, the long uh, burrow, uh, barrow at Kent in Wiltshire. It had multiple chambers. And these chambers were not for burials per se, because the bones may have been uh, actually cremated, they, they might let the body kind of decay, then separate the bones, burn the bones, and then house the bones in little basins or urns inside these crypts. Some of these long barrows were so extensive that they would have multiple entrances to different tombs. And we know these long barrows often buried uh, kin and this little diagram shows the time. Uh, and the green are men who are related. So it perhaps relates to uh, inheritance of chiefdoms or perhaps pre-kingdoms. These weren't big enough to be city-states, but we know that kin kinship and ancestor worship was very, very important. So the megalithic structures may have a great deal to do with ancestor 
reverence and veneration. Now this is a reconstruction. Some people question it because of red hair and so on, but uh, not far from Stonehenge. So he doesn't look Anatolian at all. He looks more uh, recent, but nonetheless, this is the reconstruction. Now comes the real interesting immigration, if you will, or cultural uh, flood coming out of uh, not quite uh, Mongolia, but Kazakhstan and the Bal uh, Black Sea area, a culture called Yamnaya, and they made a distinctive kind of pottery. They rode horses, they had bows and arrows, uh, and they covered all of Western Europe. And they made it very quickly into England around 2000 BC and into Spain and France and actually Denmark at the same time. It was a massive sweep. They may have traded their way across and being a sort of Northern Balkan, they had a different look. The, they are called the Bell Beaker culture and that is because the pottery they made is a, a bell-shaped beaker uh, and perhaps in, in all different sizes and many people think that these were mostly for drinking vessels but they were also storage vessels and even burial vessels. They had a wonderful stone tr tool tradition. They also brought these beaker potter pots which some people think were mugs because you can scrape out the inside and actually find residue of mead and other kinds of beer. And this may have had a great <laughs> uh, influence in the social organization. So beer didn't make it into England or across Western Europe until around 4,000 years ago. They brought in archery, uh, different kind of burial, which is very interesting because they know they did not bring megaliths. They just used uh, deep pit structures, uh, maybe with a kist that is the stones uh, forming a box. And they also brought their different genes, this unique genetic type, which is now what we call the haplotype R1b. There is a young man, interestingly, from uh, a road construction site and he was malnourished and he had eaten a lot of cereals so maybe there had been some climatic downturns but you can see how expansive this particular genetic group is and very concentrated in Spain, uh, France and England. They also brought lots of bronze tools uh, boar tusk tools, amber tools, or amber jewelry, and these pl flat plate things are wrist guards for archery. Uh, and they also brought some of the first gold found in England. Their arrowheads were remarkable, and they had bronze swords and very big arrows. Their burial, as I mentioned, was just simply pit burials. So the megaliths may have been used for celebrations. Sometimes they would bury near them with a little barrow structure, but we can tell these bell beaker people because not very ornate kinds of burials. Oops. This is a man actually found on the area of Stonehenge, but you can see he's buried with a beaker and he has a copper knife, he has an arrow, he has wonderful, beautiful arrowheads. And so he was thought to be a builder, but we realize that he is a recent uh, bell beaker incursion. He's called the uh, Amesbury Archer. You see all the different bell beaker pots and near nearby there's a statue of him and there's a bronze knife and some gold hair uh, fasteners but he did not have anything to do nor did any of the bell beaker people with the megalithic construction with them also came language in fact everyone talks about the celtic culture and the celtic language like irish and welsh and britain there's a Britain uh, form of Welsh, 
they came as part of this great uh, bell beaker Yamnaya sweep through Europe. And there's a remnant left of the Welsh and the Breton and somewhat Irish. They did bury occasionally with barrows, but usually a pit bury, burial. This is another woman from Scotland who originally was cast as red hair and blonde, a uh, red hair and fails and pale skin. She actually has olive skin and dark eyes and dark hair. But she was one of these Bell Beaker people and still lactose intolerant. So maybe dairy culture was slow to spread up to Scotland. This is another uh, Beaker burial. You can see that she's actually positioned differently and she has her mug perhaps of mead. But the position of the burial off also differs in these people. And we can look at around 4,000 years ago, most of Europe, or England in this case, were Anatolian farmers, the first agriculturals in England. And then around 2400 BC, the Beaker people come in and they swamp all of England so that 90% of the uh, people in England were completely replaced by these Bell Beaker, Beaker people. Uh, so this is what I call cultural swamping. Uh, we can look at this and see varying uh, groups of people that came in, the farmer people, uh, they disappear, and then we see uh, a different pottery group, and then finally, and two different pottery groups, the linear bandit and the corded bandit, that doesn't matter so much. And then finally, uh, the gray bell beaker, and they are the ones who make it and survive. Uh, we can see in Europe, the same thing happening. The Neolithic groups disappear in orange. Uh, the Western hunter gatherers are still there, but the bell beaker, beaker people pretty much swamp most of Western Europe. Interestingly, this is a genetic image of Europe. It's a little hard to read, but you see on the right-hand side, this line of different colors. Those represent the genotypes of most modern Europeans. And then scattered on the left-hand side, up and down, are ancient Paleolithic genotypes, so that hunter-gatherer genes still survive. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise because Neanderthal genes still su su survive as about 20% or 2% uh, modern survivors. And then we can see some of the earlier European farmers there as well. Now, one last thing that came uh, with this uh, beaker people was a different form of megalithic structure coming initially from uh, Mongolia, where these menhirs would be carved, sometimes farther east in Mongolia with deer and reindeer, elsewhere with sort of God male figures. And these are called just steli. And we suddenly see them around 3,000 years appearing all over. And they represent also the spread of this uh, Yamnaya population, and they occur again in Spain, Brittany. Uh, very few are in England, but there are some, and they even look very Celtic. And you see how widespread these steli are. And it's basically these that eventually give rise to tombstones. And they may represent the god of the person's belief, or they may represent something about them the image of the person who survived. And perhaps most importantly, with these Yamnaya people, the Bell Beaker people who came across four, five thousand BC, they brought an Indo-European language cluster that evolved as they spread to uh, Balto Slavic to Germanic to Italic to Celtic. And if we look at the history of English, it came in the initial Germanic split, the German 
form split into three groups. And then the West German split into two groups. And out of that Frisian group, Anglo-Frisian group came what we know as English. So we owe the Bell Beaker people not only uh, a debt of gratitude for bringing beer across Europe, but also for bringing our language. So megalithic builders were probably Anatolian, early agriculturalists, pastorists, but what really made a lasting impact is these Bell Beaker people. And the Bell Beaker people, about 3,000, uh, 2,000 years ago, brought their own genetic markers. And we see that today as the most prominent haplogroup, genetic group in all of Western Europe, known as the RB1. So if you do ancestry or anything like that, uh, they should give you your haplogroup. There are resident rem remnant groups like the I2, which was a remnant, uh, and the I1, which made it into uh, Sweden. So this is uh, far Mongolia, but we can see these stelae and a, uh, a basically a burial tomb, which marked them, and then also kind of curses. So here is a very distant culture way out in Mongolia, but we see megalithic elements to it. The only, that only thing that made it into Western Europe, of course, were these odd stelae, the last remnant of any kind of megalithic culture. So with that, we'll end and I'll see you the next time and we'll try to speculate why they were built.